All right, so I mentioned previously that asking questions can be a good way to start good discussions about spiritual things and plant seeds in our friends' minds and hearts, which will quietly grow for a while and then bear fruit later, perhaps. Let's discuss some thought-provoking questions, which we can ask Muslims. I didn't think these up myself. These are mostly borrowed from other people. A very simple question is, what do you believe about God? The great thing about Muslims is that most of them are eager to have conversations about God and spiritual topics, unlike many of our other non-Christian friends. Simple questions like, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about the afterlife? What do you believe about where humanity came from and where we're going, the end of the world? Uh, are questions that many Muslims enjoy talking about. Uh, likewise, asking a person to share their own story of their own personal spiritual journey is a respectful question that might have uh, be a good conversation starter if you're already in good terms with them. And for all these friends, I think that um, the main goal should be to introduce them to Jesus and invite them to read about Jesus for themselves in the Bible. Uh, because Jesus is really so amazing. Anyone who's not yet read about Jesus is missing out. So with this goal in mind, after we've learned about their own personal beliefs, we can ask them if they've ever read the Bible for themselves or the New Testament, the Injil. And if they say they've never read it, um, well, first let me say, uh, if you simply ask, have you ever read about Jesus, every Muslim will say yes, because they've read about him in the Quran. His name is Isa in the Quran. However, his description is very different in the Quran. So I always ask whether they've read about him in the Bible, in the New Testament, or in the Injil. If they say they've never read it, we can ask them, why not? Usually they'll say, because it's been corrupted. The Injil has been corrupted. And then we'll talk in upcoming videos about how to respond to that objection. It's a very important one. Sometimes it might be helpful to share a brief story from the New Testament, such as some of Jesus' parables, or uh, perhaps the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, the Pharisee and the Tax Collector, or even stories from the Old Testament about Abraham and Moses. Um, these are just great starting points because Muslims already believe in Jesus to some degree, and they uh, believe certainly in Abraham and Moses and so on. So if they're interested in these stories, then we could share more. If they're not interested, you know, just pray for them and, and don't share as much in the future until they're interested. And um, we could even invite them to study the Bible together and even both the Quran and the Bible if they want to. The Quran has very few actual complete historical stories. I think there's only one or two. Um, most of it is allusions back to earlier stories, which the people who are listening to the Quran already knew about. Stories about Abraham and Moses and David and so on. So the Bible is actually more historically complete and coherent. It has the beginning of the story, the middle of the story, the end of the story. Um, and so many parts of the Bible are easier to read and more fun to read than just the chopped up allusions in the Quran. And by the way, I think if you're serious about sharing the gospel with your Muslim friends, you should read the Quran. At least read the first five chapters. Uh, chapters in the Quran are called surahs, and they're arranged in order of length. So the longest ones are near the beginning, except for the first one. And uh, it's best to read the whole Quran if you have the time. Take a couple months, you know, read a little bit every day. Uh, then when you're talking with your Muslim friend, you'll be able to, a better position to understand them and say that you've read both the Quran and the Bible, and you can invite them to read the Bible for themselves. And I would encourage you, don't just read the Quran. Always read some of the Bible with it, because the Quran can be kind of dark and depressing if you just read it by yourself. But read the Bible along with it, or um, uh, certainly read the Bible every day. That's really good. So here are some more possible thought-provoking questions we can ask. <clears throat> Do you think it's possible to know for sure that you'll be in heaven or paradise? Muslims will say no. They don't think it's possible to know for sure. They just hope that their good deeds will outweigh their bad deeds on the day of judgment. But there are places where the Bible talks about knowing for sure. For example, Jesus' comment to the thief on the cross, Today you'll be with me in paradise, in Luke 23, 43. Or 1 John 1, chapter 5, sorry, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, that you may know that you have eternal life. And first, uh, sorry, John uh, chapter 3 and many other places. So I think this discussion could leave them thinking about this question. Is it possible to know? How is it possible that followers of Jesus can know for sure that we will be in heaven with our sins forgiven? Whereas Muslims cannot know that. And it's something to leave them thinking about. A related question to discuss is, why does the Injil say that Jesus can forgive sins? For example, Mark chapter 2, the story of the paralyzed man who was let down through the roof. Um, how could Jesus say to him, your sins are forgiven? The people who heard Jesus say that were also shocked, saying to themselves, 
Wait a minute, only God can forgive sins. So this story is perfect for leading our Muslim friend to consider, slowly, gently, and gradually, who exactly is Jesus that he could tell people their sins were forgiven and that they would be with him in paradise. And a follow-up question would be, according to the Injil, the New Testament, how can you and I know that our sins are forgiven? This naturally leads us into studying the New Testament and the answer that's given that if we simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will have our sins forgiven. We'll be saved. Acts 16 and 31. Psychologically, I think there's a very powerful difference between Islam and Christianity, which is attractive to some Muslims because this idea that we can have peace with God and know that we have peace with God and know for sure that our sins are forgiven, eternal life is guaranteed, that we will have that honor with him in paradise. Muslims will typically argue against this very strongly, and they'll object that this takes away the motivation to do good works, and we'll discuss later how to respond to that objection. But inwardly, I think many of them desire to have that same intimate relationship with God that the Bible talks about. And not only Muslims, people from all religions desire this because that's the way God made us. Everyone whom God is calling, deep down, wants to be reconciled to God. Another set of questions might be, do you know the name of God? Do you know what it means? Not his title, God in English or Allah in Arabic, but his personal name. This name was revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And by the way, it's not in the Quran anywhere. God's name is Yahweh, a four-letter word in Hebrew, which is related to the word Hayah, to be. So it might be translated in English as I am, or I am who I am, or I am that I am. It refers to God's eternal self-existence. The fact that he doesn't have a beginning, he doesn't depend on anyone else, God uses his name extensively in the Old Testament in the context of him being the God who keeps his promises. There's so much more that you could discuss this if you study it, and I'll have some links in the supplement. So if you carefully read Exodus chapter 3 with your Muslim friend, where God tells Moses to tell his people, this is my name, I am has sent me to you, that perfectly sets the stage to later look at John chapter 8 verse 58, where Jesus was talking with a group of Pharisees, and Jesus alluded back to this name of God in a powerful way, that shocked the Pharisees so much they tried to kill him immediately. Basically, Jesus claimed this name of God for himself, and you can read about it. Another great question is, do you know what Jesus' name means? Matthew 121, the name Yeshua means Yahweh's salvation, the Lord's salvation. Jesus was given that name because the angel told his parents to give him that name, saying he shall save his people from his sins. That's a great thing to discuss with our Muslim friends. What does it mean that Jesus would save his people from their sins? Another related question is, do you know what his title, Messiah, or al Masih in Arabic, in the Quran, means? Of course, um, in, um, in uh, Hebrew, it's uh, Meshech. Uh, in Greek, the same word is transliterated as uh, Christ or Christos. And uh, in Arabic, it's al Masih, And that's what he's called. So in Surah 4, 172, sorry, Surah 4, Ayah 172, and so on, that's where that name is used. The word comes from the Hebrew word to anoint, so the anointed one, meaning the chosen one, the promised special man who would break the curse, back in Genesis chapter 3. And you can go into all the prophecies about him in the Old Testament. There's so many, from Genesis 3, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 53, and so many more. Another question might be to ask what they know about what Jesus said was the purpose for why he had been sent into the world. Jesus talks about his purpose in several places. One of them is Matthew 20, verse 28, and another one is Mark 10, 45, where he said that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We can explain that the, son, uh, the term Son of Man was Jesus' frequent term for himself and came from Daniel chapter 7. You can see also Mark 14, 21, 41, and 62. Another discussion topic might be that according to the Quran and the Hadiths, Jesus, Isa, was the only prophet who never sinned. It's very interesting. It's a point of agreement between Christians and Muslims. What are the implications of this, that Jesus was the only person who never sinned? It would mean that his teachings about God are extremely valuable to learn from, and that he's very trustworthy and so on. So we should read his teachings, you know, come back, read the Bible, read the Injil. So see the supplement for more details about that. Another discussion question might be that, did you know that Christians believe there's only one God? This might be surprising to some Muslims because Muslims are taught that Christians believe in three gods. Uh, the Quran implies in Zerah 5, Ayat 116, and other verses that the Christians believe in three gods, God, Mary, and Jesus. Uh, and you can see this uh, translation here. 
So it's easy to see why some of these misinformed Muslims are upset about Christians because they think that we believe in a family of gods, you know, father, mother, and son, which is completely wrong. Christians do not believe that. So it's easy to see. And so, um, of course, the Bible is extremely clear that there's only one God. The Bible never teaches that Mary was divine. The Bible does teach that the one God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll discuss that in a separate video. But it's worth looking with our Muslim friends at the verses which teach that there's only one God. Because this is a huge point of agreement, which the Muslim may not be aware of. Here's a few of these verses. Uh, check out these ones in Isaiah. They're just beautiful and amazing. And just so clear that there's only one God. At some point, you might want to discuss the connection between Isaiah 45 and Philippians 2. But I would not bring this up immediately. Instead, I prefer to go slowly through the portrayal of Jesus in the Gospels in the New Testament. And only after my Muslim friend has a solid understanding of who Jesus is in the Gospels. Then I make the connection between Philippians 2 and Isaiah 45. Another discussion question is whether it's possible for God to lie or not. This highlights an interesting difference between God in the Bible versus God in the Quran. In Hebrews 6, 18 and Titus 1, 2, it's absolutely clear that God cannot lie. But in Quran 3, 54, uh, Allah is said to be the best of planners, and the word planner can also be translated schemer or deceiver. So we can discuss with our Muslim friend whether they think God ever deceives people or not. Our Muslim friend may agree that God cannot lie, or he might disagree. In Quran 4, 157, it says that, the, uh, that Jesus was not crucified or killed, but so it was made to appear to them. And we can ask who was deceived. Were Jesus' disciples deceived? But in the next verse of the Quran, um, uh, in Quran Surah 3, Ayah 55, Allah said, I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. So from that verse, it seems that Jesus' disciples were not deceived because the ones who became superior in the earlier church uh, believed that uh, Jesus was in fact killed and risen from the dead. So it seems like they were not deceived. So there's a lot of interesting stuff to discuss here. And I would encourage you to first be careful, do some prior research on how to reply to situations of seeming deception sanctioned by God in the Old Testament, from the Hebrew midwives of Exodus 1 to Rahab at Jericho, Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, verse 2, David, and Micaiah in 1 Kings 22, 22, Psalm 18, 26, situations of war and espionage, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 13, where it talks about God sending a delusion on the people who disbelieved in him, Romans 1, and so on. So it takes study to understand how to interpret these, but the basic theme is that the God of the Bible always tells the truth to his followers, and he makes the truth available to all, but allows those who hate him to believe lies or deception. And then in situations of war and espionage, uh, there are some situations where it is uh, acceptable to, uh, to uh, not tell the truth, according to the Bible. So now some questions related to the Quran. One extremely useful question is whether they think the Quran is eternal or created. If they say it's eternal, ask, well, are you saying the physical manuscripts made of ink and paper and go or goat skin are eternal? Uh, what about this paper copy of the Quran that says, you know, printed in 2002? They might reply, no, uh, there's a heavenly Quran, a word of God, called the mother of the book. And you can see this in Quran 56, uh, Ayah 77 through 80, Surah 43, 3 and 4. Uh, Surah 85, 21, and 22, and it talks about this tablet is eternal, and then the words were allegedly sent down by verse by verse to Muhammad via the angel Gabriel in the 6th century. So then if they say it was created, you can ask them, well, wait a minute, are you saying there was a time in the past when Allah did not have his word? His word only began to exist when he revealed it to his prophets, and they wrote it down before the time the word of Allah did not exist? They will say no. They will again talk about the heavenly eternal Quran. If they said there was a time when Allah did not have his word, that would mean that Allah was changing. At one point he was speechless, and another time he had his word. Do they believe that in a God whose attributes change over time? And they will say no. So after this, you know, first question, is the Quran eternal or not? You could ask them, so are you saying that there's two eternal things that existed before the world was created? There was God and his word? two things in heaven eternally and that is very challenging for a muslim to think about muslim um, theologians throughout history have uh, really wrestled with this uh, many muslims through
throughout history have come to this conclusion that the Quran actually has a dual nature, both an eternal spiritual nature and a physical nature. So uh, this difficulty shows that God's oneness and the Quran's eternality are not as simple as Muslims first assume, and it opens the door to explain Jesus as God's eternal word, as John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14 talk about. So quoting from uh, Dr. Han, as Orthodox Muslims understand the Quran, the word of God, to be both uncreated and created, eternal and temporal, infinite and finite, so the Bible speaks of Jesus, the word of God, to be uncreated and created, in a sense, his body was created, eternal and temporal, infinite and finite. There's an analogy here. Uh, sorry, that was uh, my insertion. But getting back to the Han quote, uh, according to the Bible, the eternal word of God became not a book, but a human being, Jesus the Messiah, end quote. So I think this question is very useful. When Muslims ask questions about the Trinity and about Jesus' divinity, you can just pull this question out, and it's very useful because it reveals that Muslims themselves have similar beliefs about the Quran as Christians have about Jesus. Another question is, which version of the Quran do you read? Most Muslims will immediately say, there is no such thing as different versions of the Quran. There's only one Arabic Quran, which is the same everywhere and never has been changed since Muhammad's time. But today we have different translations of it into different languages. However, the Muslim traditions such as Bukhari say that when Muhammad's companions were disagreeing about different words in their Quran recitations, Muhammad told them that the Quran was revealed in seven different ahruf or versions. A couple decades later, when uh, Caliph Uthman standardized the Quran text, he selected only one ahruf. Then the Quran was being memorized and recited by many different people, and these readings were called Kiraat. There are some differences between them because the Arabic writing at that time only had consonants, not vowel marks, to distinguish between words. Seven of these readers were selected as authoritative about 150 years after Muhammad. And each of these readers had two transmitters who wrote down their readings into manuscripts. Now, interestingly, the Quran was only officially canonized in 1924 in Cairo, Egypt, based on the Hafs transmission of the Asim reading. Today, there's at least uh, 31 different Arabic Qurans, which are used by Muslims in different parts of the world. And you can read more about this in the supplemental links. There's lots of information about it on the internet. Here's an example of a small difference between the Hafs Quran and the Warsh Quran. And you can actually buy these online, um, Arabic Qurans, and then you can just have a little copy to pull out and show your Muslim friends if you're interested. You can see that the consonants here in the circled area are the same, but the vowels are different. And in some other cases, the consonants are also different. In some older manuscripts, whole words have been added or removed to make the manuscripts more similar to today's uh, modern version. Here's a screenshot from one of Jay Smith's videos um, where he discusses the difference in meaning between these two words, with the Hafs version saying that the prophets fought, and the Warsh version says that the prophets were killed. And obviously these are not the same meaning. Uh, these little vowel differences have changed the meaning quite significantly. Um, although, so of course, the Bible also has textual variants. And um, the uh, Christians openly admit this and publish research about it publicly. All ancient manuscripts have textual variants, but many Muslims are not aware of these things, and they think that all Arabic Qurans are exactly the same around the world. So the question of which version they use can be a helpful discussion, kind of an opening discussion at some point. Probably not the first thing to talk about. Best to focus on Jesus. But at some point, it'd be interesting to discuss the Quran with them. And here are some excellent resources. Here's a great article that goes through this in an overview, high level. Uh, here's a book called Corrections in Early Quran Manuscripts, 20 Examples by Daniel Brubaker. Um, and he also has a YouTube channel called Variant Quran, where he goes through a lot of old Qurans and shows different variants in them. And you can see the supplement for more links on this.